Welcome to the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics. Here is your host, Lori Reichel, the Puberty Prof, a nationally recognized health educator, author of the award-winning book, Common Questions Children Ask About Puberty, and creator of the Talk Puberty app. And welcome to the Puberty Prof Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lori Reichel, the Puberty Prof. For this fall of the Puberty Prof Podcast, I've been focusing on the National Sexuality Education Standards. Standards are commonly used in the educational setting to ensure that educators are teaching age and developmentally appropriate information and skill to children and youth. In the school health education world, we have the national health education standards. And then we also have the national sexuality education standards that break down sexuality into different topic areas. And that's what this fall has been focusing on. For this specific episode, I'm going to be focusing on puberty and adolescent sexual development. I'm doing it on my own because I am the puberty prof, and this is one area that I I just have enjoyed talking with young people about and also helping parents and other caregivers do the best they can to teach young people about what's going to be happening to their bodies, as well as their, their mental, emotional, social, et cetera, changes. So this This specific episode is going to focus on puberty and adolescent sexual development. And what I've chosen to do is I've chosen to record the whole entire episode in which I'm going to have a video clip on my YouTube channel. That YouTube channel is Lori Reichel, the puberty prof. If you want to see what is specifically written for the topic area of puberty and adolescent sexual development, feel free to watch this on the YouTube channel. If you don't want to watch it, continue to listen in. So I just started sharing my screen and you'll see it's episode number 70 and the title is Puberty in Adolescent Sexual Development. Again, I'm going over the National Sexuality Education Standards in which these standards, in addition to being broken down into topics, they're also broken down into grade levels. So for puberty and adolescent sexual development, there are no items noted to be taught to children in grades K through two. If you think about it, children in these grades don't typically have changes of puberty. So we start talking about puberty in the next grade level. And for grades three through five, there are three things noted that deal specifically to those physical changes for grades three through five. The first item reads, by the end of the fifth grade, students should be able to explain the physical, social, and emotional changes that occur during puberty and adolescence and how the onset and progression of puberty can vary. So in other words, we just don't talk about those bodily changes with the hair growth and body smells and maturing genitalia. We also talk about the social aspects of puberty in which we have different changes. As a child gets older, they become more independent. In addition, they're getting more friendships. They're they're beginning to, if they haven't already, they're beginning to see their peers as more friends and sometimes they pull away from the family. It depends upon the setting at home. It depends upon the development of the child. Remember, every child is different. So there are social changes that occur. In addition, emotional changes occur. We do note that it's common for some moods, more moods to occur, in which I know when I was teaching seventh and eighth graders, I would see young people perhaps having one mood first thing in the morning, and then in two hours, it's different. In another hour, it's different. So it's common. If you think about it this way, the hormones are being released, and they're trying to figure out how to handle these hormones, which can impact our moods. For the onset and progression of puberty, this is a reminder that all children grow at their own rate. We can't speed that up for them. 
if there's something developmentally different in which they need support, we go to our medical professional and our medical professional should be able to help guide us in what to do best for our children. Yet overall, some kids are gonna start going through those changes of puberty earlier than others. It's kind of like when we make popcorn and I know I've said this in another episode or two, if you think about when you're making popcorn, some kernels of the popcorn start popping very slowly at the beginning, and then progressively there's more and more and more, and there's a whole bunch, and then it slows down, and then there's a few at the very end that pop of those kernels. That's the same thing with puberty, and that's how kids, some kids will have changes earlier, and it'll be a handful of students, and then more and more are going to start going through changes, and almost everyone seems to be, and then slowly others that are more delayed will start going through changes. So it's a bell curve shape about when children start and end going through puberty. Now, another thing that's noted within the section of puberty and adolescent sexual development is that by the end of the fifth grade, students should be able to identify credible sources of information about puberty and personal hygiene. What this means is that we teach young people and we need to teach young people who to turn to as people that if they need more information, so we go to a reliable person, not somebody that's going to uh, pretend they're not going through changes or, or just trying to solve things too quickly because we want to process these things out with young people. Um, this also includes where to go online for credible information. I don't agree with people doing a Google search and going to any website because there is misinformation out there. And we teach in the classroom setting to go to sites that are associated with .orgs, that are more educational, .govs. So we want them to go to reliable resources, which also includes medical professionals going back to people. One last statement that's in this segment reads, by the end of the fifth grade, students should be able to make a plan for maintaining personal hygiene during puberty. So if you think about it, we need to teach young people about getting into the habit in which when they wake up in the morning, what do we do for our hygiene? We wake up, we are going to brush our teeth, we're going to wash our face, and it's important to help eliminate some of the, the dirt and the germs on the face to lessen potential pimples or acne. Uh, we also have a habit of eating healthier for our skin, having some foods in moderation. We teach the hygiene habit of attempting not to touch your face during the day or only touch your face when you have clean hands. The habit of washing your clothing regularly to limit the smells, because as we're going through puberty, the physical change that we sweat more and we're gonna have more stench associated with that sweat. So if a person chooses to, they can also choose to use deodorant, or antiperspirant in the armpit area. They definitely have to have the personally, personal hygiene habit of washing in the armpit area more often for sure, and their feet make sure that we're changing socks and their underwear on a regular basis that we usually start teaching children younger, but definitely during puberty, we have to change our clothing on a regular basis and clean it really well. Uh, other personal hygiene things about flossing once a day, making sure we wash our face after athletic activities or after working out or something, uh, before going to bed, brushing our teeth again. So this is where the goal setting goes in for teaching young people about how to make a plan for our hygiene. Once people get into a habit, we just do it on a regular basis. Like I know I get up in the morning and brush my teeth and then I wash my face. Uh, so that kind of thing. Now, other things noted for grades three through five includes the following. Describe how puberty prepares human bodies for the potential to reproduce and that some healthy people have conditions that impact the ability to reproduce. So one of the reasons why we go through these physical changes is to potentially have a baby in the future. Some of us release eggs that are needed 
for that conception, some of us release sperm, which is needed for creating uh, a baby. So, and puberty helps our body start releasing those things or creating them actually more mature eggs and sperm. If somebody is able to reproduce, they need to be aware that this is a serious responsibility in their lives now. Some people, we also have to go over that some people won't be able to reproduce. Some people will choose not to reproduce and that's fine also. One other item that's noted for grades three through five includes identifying trusted adults, including parents, caregivers, and healthcare professionals whom students can ask questions about puberty and adolescent health. And I believe I already reviewed that one with another statement. So again, going to responsible people, trusted people, people that when we talk with them, we feel relief, we feel heard, we do not feel a yucky feeling in our stomach or our gut, but we feel comfortable. Even if we ask questions that at first might be awkward, but we can ask the questions and have honest conversations. Another item that is recommended to be taught somewhere within grades through, through, three through five, typically it's taught at the fifth grade level, reads, explain common human sexual development and the role of hormones, e.g. romantic and sexual feelings, masturbation, mood swings, timing of pubertal onset. So again, as I said earlier, we do talk about why we go through puberty and hormones are released and that's what can impact the emotional health of young people. Yet at the same time, they can also have these more romantic and or sexual feelings towards people. For example, that kid that we sat next to in first grade that used to be annoying to us might look a little cuter now. And I have seen this physically like with children that they all of a sudden will look more at their peers and I can see a little glint in their eye or a little smile because they have a crush on someone. That's how I can see it. Uh, they try to cover it up, but sometimes that's just, you can't cover it up because you're happy seeing a person that you think is a cutie patootie. So we recommend that we talk to young people about that, you know, sometimes you will have feelings. And when you have these feelings, they're not bad feelings, yet we need to make sure we make the best decisions on how to act on these feelings. So the mood swings part I mentioned before too, we have to provide coping skills. I know I've said that in other episodes, but how do we best cope when we have yucky feelings? Now the, the phrase masturbation, sometimes people get stuck on that word, like, wait a minute, do health teachers talk about that? Do parents talk or other caregivers talk about that? Sometimes how this will be raised in a classroom is that somebody will ask an anonymous or confidential question in a question box and say, is it okay to masturbate? Or will masturbation be bad? Does it call, cause blindness? And there were some episodes that went over masturbation in the summer of 2021 um, of this podcast, so feel free to check it out. But overall, what we say about masturbation is no, it doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, it's not gonna cause you to go blind. What's recommended is you do that in your own um, room or your own section of a room. It's something that's private. Uh, you can be done in the bathroom. It's not done during the school day when you're at school. Um, that's something that's personal. People do not have to do it. Some people choose to do it. Um, also, if there is any fluid that's released from masturbating, that the person cleans up afterwards. There are certain fluids like the um, seminal fluids, the vaginal fluids that can carry germs. So just go and wash your hands, wash anything that you've used uh, or you touched while masturbating, or if you got fluid like semen on, uh, on clothing or something like that, just clean it up. Now, if you're wondering as a parent or caregiver, how do you approach the topic? Sometimes you just might accidentally discover that your child is masturbating. You might find some certain things in their room that might have been left behind that are damp or that you heard something or you walk into their room and they're doing it. 
what's recommended is to just say, oh, I'm sorry, you need your, your private space if you catch them in the act. And you can gently talk with young people about, yeah, it's okay that you do that. This is you're trying to figure out what you feel pleasure from doing. I do understand that some people don't want to envision their child at all masturbating, uh, that they're, they, yeah, they just like, as I'm trying to even say it, it's, it's uncomfortable for folks. What some people believe is that they don't never want to do this, which is fine. Others, they do want to touch themselves to figure out their pleasure because then when they are of consensual age and they're with somebody else, that they're able to tell their partner what brings them pleasure. Part of being in a consensual relationship is if you're going to engage in sexual behaviors that both people are having pleasure, that they're both feeling pleasure, that it's not focusing on only one person over the other. And that's what we're trying to support for healthy sexual beings. The last item that's noted for grades three through five reads, by the end of fifth grade, students will be able to describe the role hormones play in the physical, social, cognitive, and emotional changes during adolescence and the potential role of hormone blockers on young people who identify as transgender. Now, I believe the idea of the hormones and how they impact the physical, social, cognitive, and emotional changes. I believe I already covered that. Again, hormones are released. Actually, uh, the pituitary gland gets involved, different body parts, the ovaries, the, the testes, and they release testosterone. We all have testosterone. Some people have higher amounts than others. Um, we all have progesterone and estrogen too, and some people have higher levels than others. So this, a lot of people feel comfortable talking about, you know, we have these rise in hormones, and then they can also drop down at times. But the hormone blockers, that's a newer concept that is taught to young people. And part of the reason why is because if a child identifies as being transgender, some families do choose to have their child research about hormone blockers or talk to a medical professional or potentially start using them. Yes, I understand that this is a debatable topic. So I'm not going to go into all the pros and cons here. I'm noting here what is recommended to start being talked about with young people, particularly when they're hearing about it. Uh, a friend of mine who just retired from teaching explained that in her middle school class, she was teaching grades six through eight, that there were students saying that they felt they were transgender. So even if a person doesn't agree to a, a young person saying that, it still put something on the table that we need to talk about. Well, what does this mean about being transgender? And then sometimes children will ask, well, what happens? What's the transition if somebody's going to, going to be transgender? So long story shorter, recognize please that typically by the fifth grade, if not the fifth and sixth, seventh, children are being exposed to concepts. Therefore, it is okay to talk with them about it. Now, that was the last thing for grades three through five. I will show on my screen, and I'll, I'll say it out loud, some of the things that are noted that by the end of the eighth grade, actually, there's only one thing in addition to the others for grades three through five, but there's one statement that's added on for by the end of eighth grade in which students should be able to define medical accuracy and analyze medically accurate sources of information about puberty, adolescent development, and sexual health. Now, by the end of 10th grade, there are two things noted for young people in which students should be able to describe the cognitive, social, and emotional changes of adolescence and early adulthood. This is where we know that they're becoming these adults, even though they think they know everything perhaps, but they're, they're are changes that will be going on because as we get older, just like when we're younger, we, we, we get more independent and our peers are going to be more influential. We're gonna have access 
to more influences. And we want young people to understand what they are, which is why the second comment in this section for by the end of 10th grade, students should be able to, to this is the second thing that's recommended. It reads, analyze how peers, media, family, society, culture, and a person's intersecting identities can influence self-concept, body image, and self-esteem. So I love talking to young people about analyzing influences. And in the ninth and 10th grade, we need to be doing that because they are exposed to so many different things. And then how do I make decisions when I'm having all these influences telling me perhaps the same thing or different things? Usually it's the different things. So one last thing about this section of puberty and adolescent sexual development is that there are no comments noted in the section of by the end of 12th grade. Most of the comments or recommendations are noted in grades three through five. So that concludes the puberty and adolescent sexual development section of the National Sexuality Education Standards. If you would like more information about specific things for puberty, like the bodily changes, check out the episodes on this podcast, The Puberty Prof, that are specific to changes that children go through overall, no matter what body parts they have. The episodes that are geared to changes that happen to most girls or the changes that happen to most boys. Uh, and all the other ones that are out there that deal with body image and decision making and all that. So they're more broken down in other episodes. This episode was specific to go over what is noted to be age and developmentally appropriate specifically for puberty and adolescent sexual development as noted in the National Sexuality Education Standards. Feel free to go to the link in this episode's description to look at that section of the standards, the National Sexuality Education Standards. Go to that. I thank you for listening in today, and I hope you have a happy and healthy day. Thank you for listening to the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics. Did you enjoy this episode? Please like, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow the Puberty Prof on Twitter or Instagram. The Puberty Prof, Lori Reichel, wants to hear from you. Go to pubertyprof.com or click on the link in this episode's description. There you can find more information, as well as ask questions to be answered by the Puberty Prof in a future episode. That's pubertyprof.com. Also, remember to check out the Talk Puberty app and the book, Common Questions Children Ask About Puberty. Until next time, this is the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics.